It's in the top 100 downloaded Ruby gems per day. It has around 2 million downloads at this point. And it's used to automate web browsers. So who here has heard about Web Rivalry before? Quite a lot of you. And probably all of you have heard of Selenium before? Most of you, okay. So just a brief history of browser automation. It sort of started with Water in 2003. That's a Ruby library that only automates IE. And in 2004, Selenium was released. Um, it supports multiple languages and a lot more browsers. And WebDriver was introduced in around 2006. Um, and what has happened since then is that most of these tools have consolidated on WebDriver as the underlying technology. So we now have Selenium 2, which is basically the old Selenium code in maintenance mode plus WebDriver. And we also have the Water WebDriver project. And this is a good thing, like automating browsers is a pretty hard thing to get right. Um, so having the development effort focused on one tool is, is good. This is the Selenium 1 API. It's basically a huge bloated API. It's grown organically. It has a single interface and all the methods takes sort of string arguments. It's really not a nice API to work with. And it has some weird stuff like multiple methods that do almost the same thing. It's basically a prime example of how to not design a good API. Um, also, since it's all JavaScript, it's sort of have some problem with the JavaScript sample. So they came up with this sort of complicated architecture to try to work around that. This is the WebDriver API. It's a lot nicer, it's object oriented, and it sort of has the benefit of hindsight when it comes to automating browsers as well. So escaping the JavaScript sandbox, there's a lot more native code to, to actually automate the browsers. Um, we have basically the same uh, language support. We have clients in Java, Ruby, Python, C Sharp, JavaScript officially, and there's some PHP and Perl bindings unofficially. Um, we also support a lot of browsers. There's Firefox, Chrome, Opera, IE, Safari, iPhone, uh, Android, HTML unit. And sort of getting to the 130 browsers is by multiplying that by browser versions and platforms, Windows, OS X, Linux. And we end up with the 130 number. So it's a quite big project to get, get right. And that's sort of why we want to stop doing it. We don't want to develop this anymore. So we're making it into a standard and try to push the browser vendors to actually implement the web, web driver APIs or the, the protocol. Um, that's sort of the plan for world domination. So far, we have Google on board doing Chrome and Android implementations of web driver. Opera is doing their own web driver. Mozilla kind of wants to take over the Firefox driver. Um, so they're sort of on the fence. But it's being built, like the web driver protocol is being built into boot to gecko So they're on the way. Um, for Apple and Microsoft, we're not really sure. We haven't really heard from them. So this talk I'm going to not sort of try to convince you to use WebDriver or even convince you to do web testing. I'm sort of going into how WebDriver works internally and how we actually automate these browsers. So there's a few architectural themes. Um, first, we try to emulate the user. We prove that the drivers work. As a developer, you shouldn't need to understand how everything works. And every API call in WebDriver is a remote procedure call. So what does this mean? Emulating the user means that the, the library is designed to accurately emulate the user interaction with the web application. 
So we try to use native events where we can, but we also want to make it easy to develop. So we try to make it easy to do cross-browser. And the API should basically match the user interactions. We don't give you like more love level stuff, that, that like fire event. We want to write tests against an API that actually matches user interactions. And the API is sort of sacred. We intentionally try to keep it small to sort of not end up in the same place as Selenium did. So we're very strict about adding new, new stuff to the API. We also prove that the drivers work by having an extensive automated test suite. Most, most of them are integration tests. There's about 600 integration tests for the Java client. Um, we have a strong culture for adding tests when we find bugs. And this sort of gives us a sort of challenging CI setup. Um, like running 70 builds per commit, is, it's not that simple. Um, but it helps. Also, you should need to understand how everything works. So there's lots of languages and technologies in use. Um, and the architecture should, should sort of allow developers to focus their talent where it will be most productive. So we try to keep that in mind. And last, every API call is a remote, remote procedure call. We're making calls from um, languages like Ruby or Python, and we need to talk to the browsers. So we need to have some RPC mechanism. And since we're doing this for every API call, the performance is sort of at the mercy of network latency. And this introduces some tension uh, into the API design, where you can have a more coarse API, which will give us better performance, but we want to keep it expressive and easy to use. So going into the internals of WebDriver, this is sort of the layers. The user is using the WebDriver API. Beneath that sits the service provider interface, which is basically a set of command and response mappings. And we have a wire protocol uh, beneath that, uh, which actually talks to the browsers. So the API is user facing. The SPI is implemented facing. And this is basically what it looks like. So you can find an element that's a command and response pair. And actually sending keys to that element, sending keystrokes, is not a command and response pair. The user facing API is object oriented, the SPI is procedural. Um, You'll notice the web element abstraction, like we get an element back, it's, it's not present. There's just opaque identifiers being passed back and forth. So that's two sides um, of the architecture. There's also another side. So the part we're trying to standardize is the API and the SPI. Um, Whereas WebDriver or Selenium 2 is considered the reference implementation of the, of the spec, which includes a wire protocol and the actual code that drives the browsers. So the wire protocol. In spec terms, it's not something that's actually required by the implementers, but it comes, it comes with the benefits of actually having existing clients in five or more languages that will be able to talk to your browser, which is a good thing. So communicating between these browsers, finding, yeah, what would be a good way for them to communicate? And sort of the most ubiquitous solution is using JSON over HTTP because all the languages know it and all the browsers know it. So that's, that's how our wire protocol is implemented. It's basically a client-server architecture. The browser acts as a server, and you have language-specific clients. This also comes with some nice properties, like you can run this on a single machine locally while developing tests. You can also scale out and move the browser off 
to the to another machine and having the actual tests running on a different machine. It's the exact same wire protocol. You just have the server in between that acts as a dumb proxy. It just pipes commands uh, from the client to the browser. And this also scales up to a grid system. So the Selenium grid, you just use the same protocol, just piping commands through. Um, the vi wire protocol is sort of restish. It maps the SPI commands to this restish interface. Um, yeah, so you basically a simple HTTP API. And the wire protocol is also really well documented. So it's really easy to create new clients. Like if you wanted to do another language or another driver for that matter, it's pretty easy to do because you have um, have a good set of documentation. And it's well defined what to do if you want to do a new driver. You can reuse the existing test suites. Um, you just implement the server side of this protocol. Um, the next layer is what we call the automation atoms. It's sort of a cross-browser JavaScript library for doing the things that the driver um, wants to do. It's written with the Google Closure library and the compiler. And it gives us some nice features, the compilation. So you will have this shared set of atoms, which we compile down to browser-specific code. And it will take out branches that are not, since we know beforehand, what browser we're we going, we're compiling for. We can remove branches that are specific to one browser. Um, so it makes it easy to share code between between drivers. Um, we also have some native code that runs in the browser, and we use that when it's needed. But otherwise, we want to maximize ease of development. Then JavaScript comes in handy. A good example of this is getting the visible text of an element. Um, it's hard to rely on the browsers. Inner text, for example, differs a lot. Um, so having a shared implementation of this makes things a lot simpler. So going through each driver, the Firefox driver is implemented as a Firefox extension, where we actually have a small HTTP server running inside the extension, and the client just makes HTTP calls to this. And it will have the, the JavaScript atoms inside and call out to XPCOM APIs if necessary. Um, the Chrome driver is a bit different. It's a standalone executable written in C++. Um, the best part is it's actually maintained by the Chromium team. So we don't actually really touch this code. Um, they regularly pull in the JavaScript atoms from our code base. Um, and inject it in this C++, C++ application. It's using Mongoose, which is a small embeddable C, C HTTP server. And it ends up calling out to Chrome through their internal IPC mechanism, which is called automation proxy. IE driver is quite similar. It's maintained by us, but it's basically the same. It's a small C HTTP server which talks to IE via common APIs, also using the atoms. The Opera driver is written in Java, so it's using Jetty and the atoms, and it calls out to Opera through their scope protocol, which is based on protocol buffers. And here again, it's maintained by Opera, so we don't really need to worry. They make it work. Android, much the same. Embed a small HTTP server on the device or in the simulator. It will talk to Android APIs to actually drive the browser. And the same with iPhone or iOS. Um, Safari is a bit different. Um, it's actually using WebSockets as the transport uh, instead of HTTP. So here the client and the server Architecture is reversed. It's in, implemented as a Safari extension. Um, but here the client acts as a WebSocket server, 
and Safari connects to it. So what I'd like to do is sort of give you a deep dive into the code base and implement the ability to maximize the browser for Firefox. Let's see how that goes. Um, there's basically three steps. First, make the Ruby client work, then make the Firefox extension work, and have an Atom that will actually maximize the browser. So we'll try that. Let's see. Can you see this? Just uh... okay. So what we want to do is is add a test that will test from Ruby that we can maximize the browser window. Um, Zoom. Hmm? Zoom. Zoom, okay. Is that better? So we have this um, window object that we can use. Um, I'll start by just resizing it to a pretty small size. This is the API we want to add. Actually, I can show you what we have right now. So we, here we have Firefox. Um, sure. This is sort of the canonical head driver example. Go to Google. Like this. We also have this window um, object, which we can resize. So yeah. So that works. What we want to do is be able to maximize, which we can't at the moment. So doing a test for this, maybe not the best test, but I'll just check that the size is, that the window has grown basically. So we will say, um, Just a search. Right. I'll just focus this example so we don't need to run the thing. Let's see what happens. Right, so it fails that we don't have a maximize method on this window object. So we'll add that. Um, so this window class basically just delegates down to an object that implements the SPI, like the flattened API. Um, so we're basically just calling out to a procedural version of the same, same thing. So just call bridge maximize window. And the bridge is responsible for actually executing these HTTP calls. Um, we'll need to add it here as well. Just tell it it's the current window. And this is using 
a mapping of commands to to URLs, basically. So we'll need to add um, add this command as well. Just going to do that. So if we try this again. Um, right, so basically we're getting a 404 from the server inside Firefox. So the Ruby client is more or less done. We can move on to adding this to Firefox. Um, so here's the, the Firefox extension part of it at least uh, and we have we're basically just binding URLs to um, functions so we're going to do that for maximize um, yeah let's take this this is a post And it ends up calling to the Firefox driver um, object. Um, so we'll need to add something here as well. Let's find something in load. Right. Let's take this. Um, so I'm not going to do anything right now, I'm just going to send the response. So we'll see the test fail again. I'm basically just asserting it targets the current window because we don't have the ability to resize others at the moment. And then just sending the response back to the client. And yeah, since I'm now editing the JavaScript code, it will need to recompile it. So. I have to wait for that. Hmm. Right. All right, so since we didn't actually do anything, like we know the HTTP stuff is hooked up, but it didn't actually resize the window. So we're just getting the same size uh, that we resized to originally. So this is where we leave the Firefox driver code and we call out this bot uh, object, which is part of the automation atoms. So that's code that's basically shared between between browsers, and we want to call maximize on that, and we want to actually pass it the current window, which we get from this session. So moving into this, the atoms. Um, it basically already has functions to get and set the size of the window and get and set the position of the window. So we're going to use that to to actually maximize the window. Just the easiest thing that works at the moment. I'm just going to steal this. So what we want to do, we want to position the window in the top left corner and make it the maximum size it can be. And to do that, we need to know 
what the top left position is and what the maximum size is. So we'll do um, get that from the screen object. And then we just want to call out this uh, set position and set size. So I think that should work. We'll see. This is going to take a while longer to compile since we're actually editing the atoms, which is sort of a core component. So it needs to recompile a bunch of things. So I hope I didn't make any mistakes. Probably did. Ooh. All right. So that worked. Yeah, how are we doing on time? All right. That's basically what I had to show you. Any questions? First. <laughs> And no one can answer questions. If we have any. No. Okay. Left side. 